previous meeting, which I uh, listened to about, you know, the reporting that's occurring, and you heard about nobody's going to be measuring. You have a temporary urgency change petition, and in the temporary urgency change petition, it basically says the following thing, and Tom can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but my paraphrasing of it is, is that DWR and the Bureau basically said that depletions in the Delta are occurring, those people don't have rights to divert that water, they shouldn't be diverting that water, and therefore we're not impacting any legal user of water in the Delta because the people who are diverting water down there are diverting it illegally. Now they didn't come right out and say it that way, but that's the gist of what was said in the, in the statement. Then you heard again today, your staff says it's a black box. So one of the things that we pointed out since 1995 to the present, and this is one of these things that we talked about before is, maybe this is one of these issues we're going to need to address as part of this drought and moving forward. The problem in the Delta is this. So let's go to the summertime this summer and let's say hypothetically the flow at Vernalis is 250 CFS in the summertime. South Delta depletions are on the magnitude of about 800 to 1,000 CFS. Those rights, when you look at those rights, they are from the San Joaquin River or its distributaries, okay? So whether it's Old River, Middle River, or the main stem San Joaquin, they're taking that water. Well, if you do a quick balance, I'm not a mathematician, but if 250 CFS is coming in and 1,000 is going out, then you, you're running negative. So what we pointed out in our papers was that's a problem. Well, really what the problem is, there's, there's no problem in the South Delta that people have water rights. They, they have riparian rights. They may have post-14 rights. They may have a combination of the two, okay? But the problem is what water is occurring in the Delta is just because water is there doesn't mean you can take it. If, if it's all stored water right. that's in the delta that's being released by the project, which is kind of the basis of your term 91, term 93, riparians aren't entitled to take it. That's right. California law, right. okay? So if they're not entitled to take it, they shouldn't be. You should be enforcing that. Now, conversely, if they are taking it under their appropriative rights and they're juniors, then they should be cut off. Knowing what I know about water rights in the South Delta, all the water rights on the San Joaquin River in the South Delta are junior to the upstreams. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, the question is, then why is anybody in the South Delta diverting? And this is one of the larger contexts because we raise this in connection with what public trust flows are going to be made available. Can those people be diverting those during those time periods? How does that equate to Delta outflow? So this is one of the larger issues that's been around for 20, 30 years we're going to have to get a handle on it, and maybe this is the drought, and maybe this is the time that we start addressing that issue and see if we can get resolution on what water is available at what times in the delta for diversion by delta diverters. Um, I have no further comments or questions. I, I will say one thing. If you do have further meetings, um, my agencies would be very, um, uh, would look forward to that. We would like to assist your staff. We have people on the ground who've been managing these systems for 20, 25 years on the tributaries to help your staff assist them understanding the water supply, the runoff, the timing, and the uses. So we would, if your staff wishes to avail those uh, our resources, we would be happy to do that. Can I ask a question just sure. to be clear on what you said a little bit earlier on? You were, you were talking about the 1925 adjudication of the San Joaquin. So what you're saying Stanislaus. is... No, Stanislaus. Stanislaus, sorry. Stanislaus. So what you're saying is that any curtailment notices that we did on the Stanislaus should follow the adjudication rather than well, that's the face of the right. No, nope, it is, gets That's more not what you're suggesting? No, nope, it gets more complicated than that. So see, what happens after the 1925 adjudication is projects are built on the Stanislaus River that have post-14 water rights. Right. And then you have new Maloney's stuck right in the middle, this 2.5 million acre foot reservoir. Mm -hmm. Then you have an agreement between the senior water right holders and the junior water right holders. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you could fashion a curtailment notice on the Stanislaus River. And I've been thinking about it a lot. 
And with the OCAP biological opinion in place, I don't know how you'd do that either. Because you might have a fed, I'm not saying you do, but there might be a federal preemption argument regarding ESA. I don't know if it's not there or not. I, so what I'm saying, though, is You're just saying we have these to factor issues, all this into what we do. Yeah, these issues, I mean, it's just not simple. I mean, I, and I'm not saying your staff looks at it simple. I know Mr. O'Hagan very well, and he's very good at this. But, but the problem is, is that if you just look at the face value of these water rights, looking at the face value of the water rights doesn't match up to what's out in the system. So mm -hmm. like that graph that was shown earlier says, you know, the demand goes like this. Well, actually, if you looked at the pre-14 water rights, on March 1st, they're going to be at eight to 10,000 CFS. Because if you look at the exchange contractors and the others, and then the line, the supply line is already way below that. So that's, okay. that's the issue. Thanks. Did, did I hear Mr. Herrick yesterday offer to meet with, was it with you or, or with, the, with the San Joaquin groups or was it with the Bureau? No, Mr. Herrick has offered to meet with the Stanislaus and the Bureau on operations of New Maloney's. Uh, previously in the past, uh, New Maloney's and uh, the Bureau, the, um, the United States Bureau of Reclamation have made requests for temporary urgent urgency change petitions for the San Joaquin River. So I think they did it, and your staff knows this, 2002 and 2003, Tom? when they sought relief in February. Don't know the exact dates, but basically, I would not be surprised. I don't know what the Bureau has in the store, but they have a salinity requirement and a flow requirement that they're required to meet at Vernalis. Probably meeting the February through uh, June flow requirement, they can probably do February and March because conditions are so low and releases under the OCAP biological opinion table 2E flows are probably adequate to get you pretty close to meeting the requirement at Vernalis. The problem is going to be is, gee, we're back to this, the April-May pulse flow is under your requirement, it's going to be 3,100 uh, CFS for 31 days. That's not going to be met. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be amazed if we get to 1,000 CFS for 31 days April-May based on the projected releases. And then after the April-May pulse flow, given how dry antecedent conditions are in the basin and the 2E flows, uh, it would probably be very difficult for the Bureau to meet its obligation uh, from May 15th to the end of June. And then there's a salinity requirement. Mm -hmm. And the salinity requirement, as Mr. Herrick uh, correctly pointed out, goes to 0.7 uh, on, on uh, April 1st on a 31-day 31, 31 winning average. Well, one of the interesting things about this that we pointed out previously is if you're releasing stored water to freshen up a system for riparians downstream, well, releasing stored water, the riparians can't take it because it's stored water. So one of the things we pointed out previously is why are we doing that? And then the other question is, you're going to be down around 200, 250 CFS. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether or not, given what we know about how salty things get during these dry years, uh, what amount of water would be required to be released from New Maloney's to meet that. I would, I would gather you will see an urgency change petition probably coming from them mm -hmm. uh, after they do their February forecast and allocations for the San Joaquin River, and that will directly impact uh, interior delta salinity requirements and downstream water surface elevation requirements. No. Anything right. else? No, thank you. No, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for, for the, the request time. yesterday, too. Okay. Stephanie Morris for the state water contractors. Hi. Good morning. My you name said Steph you only need two, but I'll give you five. And if you finish it too, everybody will be appreciative. But <laughs> say what you have. There's a lot going on, so you take your. I'll five. be fast. I'll, no, I'll whatever. Give Mr. Olafin my time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only time, though. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to comment. I don't want to take uh, your time, but 
we will be submitting written comments um, so that we, we don't take the time today with a presentation. But state, on behalf of the state water contractors and our member agencies, we just wanted to thank the board, the board staff, and all the state and federal agencies that have been coordinating and having such a swift response to this critical condition. So thank you for your time and your response. Thank you. Uh, John Rubin, San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is John Rubin, Senior Staff Counsel for the San Luis and Delta Mendota Water Authority. I too will make a very uh, brief um, statement today. The members of the Water Authority serve people that are um, directly and severely affected by the drought and the shortages in water supply um, that, that uh, are being realized here in California. The Water Authority appreciates the attention by the State Board um, to the drought and the shortages and appreciates the, the, the very quick action taken by the State Board, State Board staff, other state agencies and federal agencies to try to alleviate some of the impacts of, of the shortages. The Water Authority expects additional actions will be required mm -hmm. and the Water Authority is ready and willing to assist the State Board, other state agencies and federal agencies um, as those actions are being proposed and taken. With that, unless there's questions, um, my presentation is over. All right. Thank you and thank you for being with us all day yesterday as well. Uh, Barbara Vlamis again, Aqua Alliance. Okay, put it in the back. She spoke yesterday. Oh, here she is. No, she's here. All right. We don't have a zillion cards, which is why I'm not making you and Michael wait till the end since she spoke yesterday. So. Thank you so much. I, sure. I just wanted to add um, a couple of things after hearing some of the presentations yesterday. Uh, one uh, is to encourage you to prioritize some of these streams that you heard about from the fishery agencies. Mm -hmm. In my region of California, they mentioned Mill Creek, Deer Creek, and Butte Creek. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, was, uh, I have some information right here that might help you understand the urgency. Uh, Mill Creek, for example, the state f fully adjudicated water rights on Mill Creek in the 20s, mm -hmm. and flow records show that authorized diversions in Lower Mill Creek 203 CFS have the potential to entirely eliminate um, natural stream flow during the summer irrigation season. Uh, anyway, it seemed those three tributaries, so important for the fish, seem like something that should be looked at as quickly as possible by staff. I, so I would like to encourage you to do that. Also, um, I wanted to let you know that so many of the documents that uh, have come out from Delta Stewardship Council, BDCP, and all these things keep referring to our groundwater basins as in balance, incorrect. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you just one example to keep this short. Um, Butte County just gave an update on uh, the monitoring that they are doing. and. They have some wells that go back to 1962. And while it is true that after some severe events or a, a lot of pumping, there is recovery, but we have this gradual trend downward. And Glen County has also uh, considered, which I, would, I never thought I would hear the day, are considering a moratorium on wells. So the North State is not this groundwater haven that everybody can turn to when there's a crisis either. And this dry year, is it's going to be hit hard, and I think you know that, but I thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks for traveling down here, too. Yeah. Uh, next, Michael Jackson for Sea Wind and Sea Spa. The... Uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about curtailment. Yeah. Um, it's important as you start um, thinking about how you're going to try to best use water through this time of crisis, that you start at the absolute top of each watershed. Um, I'm going to use, um, I'm, I'm going to use 
uh, this, the Feather River as an example because that's where I live. Um, there are some small reservoirs at the top of the watershed. They're owned by DWR, part of the state water project. Um, below there, um, there are people growing grass for cows. Um, by the time um, we reach March, uh, there's almost no runoff happening from rain events because the ground is so dry and the forest is sucking it all up. Um, by the time we reach March, any water that's in the stream will have to come from releases from the state water project or basically you're going to eliminate an ecosystem, ecosystems for uh, in Sierra Valley, in Indian Valley um, that are 80, 90 miles long. Um, the water will go subterranean if the pumping is allowed. Um, sort of like mill and deer where the spring run salmon have their own refugia that Barbara just talked about. Um, the theory is, uh, and, and I think it's right, uh, Mr. O'Laughlin said so, so it must be right, um, that um, these people are not entitled to stored water in those DWR reservoirs. So you could re release water from the upper DWR reservoirs. You're not going to lose it because it's going to get collected at Oroville. So you have an opportunity by starting at the top for keeping part of um, the uh, ecosystems on each of these above the rim dam watersheds alive by how you operate those without losing water or, or large amounts of water because it just collects at the end of the year or along the year in the rim dams. Uh, and then may be available for next year. Interesting. Now that's what you could do with the stored water in the PG&E system, with the stored water in Placer County Water Agency system, in a, in a large number of the systems throughout the Sierra and the Cascade Range. Um, the question that I haven't heard mentioned by anybody that um, I think is going to cause a, a tremendous amount of uh, consternation is no one has the right to take the project's stored water. Mm -hmm. But the real question is, do the projects have right to store water now? Right. Because if you're not meeting the senior water rights down below these reservoirs, and you have natural flow coming into these reservoirs, shouldn't they be required by California law to pass it through to the seniors below them? And so I'd really like to see an examination of, it's not just direct diversion rights with these reservoirs, it's storage rights. And those storage rights are junior right. mm -hmm. on most of these drainages. So um, I'd like to see an analysis of that. In regard to the transparency, um, all of the things that have been put on the screen at this hearing, uh, I hope can be put or will be put on, on the web so that there is a record of everything you were considering all the way through this, that those of us who are going to have to sort out these problems in the old archaic fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't get to do kumbaya when our clients are cut off and they believe somebody else is, is uh, taking the water for a use that in under the water rights is a, is a junior use, like collecting it in Oroville when the people down below, I, I, I don't know if Paul Manazian is in the room. The people down below Oroville who have storage rights in Lake Almanor above Lor Oroville, um, those old storage rights, um, uh, there may be agreements 
Um, but um, clearly as they begin to lose uh, priority, because all of the water that would flow past their farms is now being held up in Oroville by the junior state water project. Um, I, I think you're going to hear regular, regularly from people down below who are going to be asking about whether or not you can store water uh, under those rights. Right. And, and so the idea that, um, and this is, I guess, you're, a pet peeve. You're, wrap, you're wrapping up now, right? I'm wrapping up. Thank you. I guess this is a pet peeve. But the idea that the Kumbaya I saw the first day was with junior water rights holders. The DWR and the Bureau are not solely government agencies. They are water wholesalers with their own interest. And so to rely on them um, does not make me, as an example, um, feel very secure. Um, so in regard, that's why we're asking for the transparency. Please put all of the things that we've seen in the last two days on the web so that we can all use them uh, fairly. Yeah, well, they, they always are posted. They'll be posted. You can get a DVD of the whole hearing if you'd like. All right. Well, I got well. a call from Nomalini that, this morning to make sure. So no, I'm, that, I'm just transferring the information. That is always the case. Also, d do you all want to explain a little bit for the folks listening the storage, um, the storage issue that yeah, Michael just uh, said uh, in terms of the right to store? Sure. When the board issues curtailment notices, they'll do it based on water right priority. And if a person gets a curtailment notice because of the date of their priority, they have to cease direct diversion. And if they have a storage reservoir, they have to pass that water through, any inflow into the reservoir through for senior water right holders downstream. Uh, the projects uh, would get a curtailment notice uh, just like anyone else based on their water right priorities. Right. Thanks. Mr. Okay, and and the, and the point is that that four million acre feet or two million acre feet uh, uh, resulting uh, that was on the the uh, water analysis, um, you might uh, operate very conservatively on that water this year because they may not be able to store this year, even if it rains. Right. Right. Okay. Felice Pace. I am an educable unit. Yes. Felice Pace representing the Klamath Forest Alliance. I wanted to just uh, express appreciation for the chair and the whole board's concern for disclosure. Uh, when we have these real-time teams, decisions need to be made quickly and making provision for having those come public is, uh, is appreciated by the public. And, um, you know, I, I, just a couple of comments because I, I hope these, uh, based on what was said this morning, I hope these will help the board in their deliberations. Um, the statements uh, and reporting and the online reporting, I had some experience with that in the last couple of years. I, I looked at that and I saw that um, a irrigation district in the, in the Scott River was uh, according to the report, was taking a surplus right that was junior to Forest Service in-stream right for fish. And, and it looked like they were taking that right and went under the Scott River adjudication. They didn't have a right to take the surplus water. Uh, so I did a little complaint and it was investigated by, by the staff. And what they found was they actually were diverting less because there was less there. They weren't actually diverting the surplus right. But they were reporting the surplus right. And I don't know how widespread this is, but apparently what was happening in that case is rather than actually measure what they were diverting, what they were reporting was what their, they figured their right was. Mm to fill that. So, you know, that's something that I don't know that, you know, it came out in the investigation report uh, and I see some nodding heads going over there. So that's something I think, you know, the board wants to be aware of and apparently the staff is aware of it, that that's happening and I don't know how widespread it is. Um, on these public trust flows, uh, 
it was interesting I found this morning that, uh, you know, the public trust flows weren't in the graphs. And what kind of message does that, does that deliver? But I think, you know, what it really indicates is that um, we're not sure what the public trust flows are in a lot of cases. It, where they do show up is in the delta because, you know, the delta sucks up most of the energy and, and it has those flow requirements. So where we have those ESA requirements, and what that made me wonder is if the board might want to, because of the board's interest in uh, public trust flows, might want to, when we get past this crisis, uh, have uh, get a handle on what we know in the different watersheds about the public trust flows. What's the state of the data? Are they adjudicated? Are there adjudicated in-stream flows? Are there ESA-defined flows in the different watersheds? Mm -hmm. Are there flow studies that have been done in different watersheds? So that when you look at the issue, uh, and you know, I think uh, it's reasonable to anticipate that there could be challenges if, if the board tries to protect in-stream flows that could be seeing some legal challenges to that. And it would be maybe prudent to get an idea of where the data is. Yesterday, you, I think you, some of you referred to, um, uh, and some of the testimony referred to wanting to get the DW, uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, flow studies done as quickly as mm -hmm. possible. But a report uh, would be very useful, I think, to the board and the public and the staff that, that showed where we were in the different watersheds in terms of uh, how those if those flows are defined in law, uh, if there have been the studies, and so forth and so on. Um, one, just one more comment, which is that the um, uh, uncontrolled spill was referred to, you know, that it could, I mean, if we, if we keep water in storage and then we get a wet year, mm -hmm. that, you know, we could be then, um, and, and that was used uh, the fact that that happens sometimes, that we have, have to spill water and let it flow. Uh, of course, there's two points on that. One is that we know now from science that the high flows, uh, having high flows in winter is important to the ecosystems, to the aquatic ecosystems, and right on up to the fish. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's settled science. But also, that was used as a, an argument for more storage, more above ground storage. And I just wanted to point out that, you know, there's, there's a lot of room in groundwater, <laughs> in, in underground for storage, and it doesn't evaporate. So, you know, I just wanted to remind us all that an alternative to more above ground storage is below ground storage right. when we have that, uh, what we consider to be excess flows. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Phil Manazian from the Exchange Contractors. My name is Paul Manassian. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Uh, I represent a number of people in Northern California and the Exchange Contractors. And in a time of crisis, uh, sometimes we need to sit back and, and try to look at not just the carryover issue, and Member Pavley pointed out the importance of thinking about next year. Let's think about five years from now. And I'm a little right. surprised that the board members, at least in your comments, I suspect you're thinking about this. But if you'd been on the board five years ago, what would you have done? You would have pushed the administration to put together four storage projects. You know the names. We long ago decided that we were going to try to solve the water problem in California by storage of water for these dry periods, albeit this is an extraordinarily dry period. We were going to solve the complexity of priority by contracts, and we were going to have the state and the federal government administer those contracts, regulate the flows, and deliver water. Now, we now would have five or six years to build those reservoirs. And if you want to ask yourself what you could do that would really solve this problem, it is that. You would 
establish a principle that no longer will we ask the question how much water out of the reservoir has to go to salinity control, public trust resources free, we'd be willing to pay the costs of whatever water you want to dedicate to refuges, to public trust, which has been the battle that you've spent all your time on in the last 10 or 12 years. The question has been, how much water can you wrench from the projects or from water right holders free because the public doesn't want to pay for public trust uses of storage or re-regulation? So identifying our mistakes and building on those mistakes in the future is the constructive thing that we can do. Now, when we get in an emergency like this, oftentimes we make mistakes. And, and I've not been able to figure that out, exactly why that occurs, because we're all very wise. And some of us are very old. And we have seen the mistakes of the past. But the idea that you might intercede and try to make a decision about the amounts of carryover water take from the state and federal project operators who are hydrologists, who are operators, who administer these systems of contracts and of priority, to me, is extremely dangerous. It doesn't mean that you're going to make a better decision than they are. And trying to hypothesize whether it will be wet or dry next year is nonsensical. We are in a situation where if it is another dry year next year, we will not have any permanent plantings in California. Maybe that's a proper system. Maybe you ought to hold a hearing on that. Because if we don't build more storage, Nobody should be in a situation where their crop will die on the field and have no remedy. So, so that would be a, a suitable subject for you. And, and it would show an, a concept of what we can do to plan. Now, let me, let me take you back to the order that you're dealing with here. Uh, Tom Howard and I have known each other uh, by sight and by uh, uh, periodic conversations, and I have the greatest respect for him. But you put your foot through Tom, through a door. You saw there was an emergency. They were about to lose the delta in terms of salinity control. And you felt that you had to say, that the water that is pumped as a result of reducing the outflow requirements has to be dedicated to public health and safety. But when you put your foot through that door, you ignored a couple of principles of California water law. And those are important principles. There's a priority for pumping, which is based upon the water rights. So how can you, as a public agency, take 1,500 CFS and say, now we're going to take this out of the system of priority? What you did was the right thing. I don't think you needed to go that far to declare an emergency. And I think it's a very bad principle. Because effectively what you're saying is you can't use that to comply with the contracts that the state and federal government has entered into. And you can't use it, that 1,500 savings, as a part of your overall operations to spare the carryover. You can remedy that, clearly. Analogies help me. I don't know if it will help you. When we have a serious problem in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
we can make it really, really, really bad by trying to fix it. Or we can think carefully about the limitations of our power and authority. Think about the system that has developed over 100 years. And that system's pretty valuable. And if you started today to advance four storage projects and enough of this taken free water for public trust, natural uses, and you made a reasoned decision about how much salinity we're going to accept in the delta throughout the year, and believe me, we are not going to meet decision 1641 standards. The exchange contractors and others will be using water that is more saline than we should be using for the soil and the crops. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Karna, sorry if I'm not reading this right, Harrisfield, the Hiram Crabtree. Herringfeld. Herringfeld. Really? Okay, sorry. Herringfeld. Got it. Thank Good you. Good morning. Sorry. It's pretty um, handwriting. I just couldn't read it. My firm represents a number of the irrigation districts along the San Joaquin River that have either riparian, pre-14, or post-14 rights. Um, a number of the general managers were here yesterday and, frankly, left early because the discussion of curtailment didn't really occur. They didn't learn anything, um, so they didn't speak. Um, I want to thank your staff today for, for what they did. It, it was a little bit better of an explanation. And um, just in terms of input, I, I'm not entirely clear, even from their presentation, what exactly they're going to do. Um, I, I've heard a couple of you indicate that they should reach out to the water users. And I really honestly, especially along the San Joaquin River, there aren't that many diverters. Um, there's Patterson Irrigation District, West Dan Irrigation District. There's um, uh, BCID, Banta Carbona. Um, West Side Irrigation District. We represent all, all of those districts, and and frankly, I, I have been at the board meetings, and my board members ask me, you know, what is going to happen, and I've contacted your staff, and we don't, they don't know, we don't know, and so I would strongly encourage you to directly interface, have your staff directly interface with the with the larger diverters because they they need to know, they need to advise their growers on what they can and can't do. Um, the, the other question, and this pertains in particular to, to West Side Irrigation District, they divert on Old River. Um, they have a very senior, senior right. I think it's 1917, um, 82 CFS. They divert um, on, or, on or about April 1st through the end of October. In 77, they were not impacted by the drought. There is water normally always in the delta. They are senior. The um, installation that we heard yesterday of the head of Old River, or not head of Old River, the Old River barrier, um, it, it, that manages their water levels that provides them with the, you, you know, an adequate supply. H how are you treating those in delta diverters? Water is always in the delta. Um, so, you know, I don't know what I don't know what to tell them. So my my um, advice to your staff is to is to put out as much information as you possibly can. In my calls to the state board, I got a call back from a junior enforcement guy who basically said, "Check our website." Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> checking your website isn't you know for the frequently asked questions that that just frankly is 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 not adequate we need real information so we can advise our growers and make um, you know real responsible decisions um, putting my Stockton East Water District hat on um, I wanted to let you know that we have been working with reclamation uh, Mr. O'Loughlin is absolutely correct in saying that flows on the San Joaquin are going to be very low mm -hmm. the uh, flow requirement for the April to May pulse flow period is in excess of 3,000 CFS under 2E, which are the Bureau's requirements under the BIOP. You're looking at 750 CFS coming out during that 31-day period. Um, I don't, I'm not clear what the flows will be on the Merced or the Tuolumne, but it's going to be well below 3,000. So we are trying to develop a, a proposal and, and an approach with reclamation, and I did uh, discuss it with John Herrick as well as to how we're 
you know, intending to operate new Maloney's to, to balance the need of all of the water users. So you should be expecting a, an additional change petition, or I don't know if it'll I anticipate bear it out we'll be getting a lot of change petitions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you can hang around, maybe someone can just talk to you right after at the conclusion of the hearing. Um, next, we have Bob Anderson, Executive Director, United Wine Growers. Thanks for being with us both days, Bob. Thank you for the opportunity. Bob Anderson, United Wine Growers in Sonoma County, represent both growers and wineries. And decided to put in a card and make a comment today because I feel for you as a board, <laughs> the issues. I mean, I think yesterday I was struck by one year observation. The room was not standing room only. There were a few hot light cameras, but what happened? Where, where's the interest? And where I come from in the Russian River, we understand the severity of this. I've heard data provided to you. I mean, I'm, I'm not a water person. I don't understand the state projects and all the complexities that you face in trying to sort through those messes. But I would just share the observation that if you had just one of those watersheds to worry about, it would be all the time and effort I think you could lend to seeking a solution, let alone trying to find solutions that work across multiple watersheds uh, and the severity of what, what we're facing. And w would just encourage you to think through, I'll share this observation, that in a good year, the system that I think staff laid out for you, California water law, the way it works, a priority system, that works maybe in a good year. It's not been applied, as far as I know, in the Russian, even in a good year. In the horrible year that we face, it will work horribly. I mean, I, I'm just struck by the divide between where I think things stand on the ground and where I hear the process. It's considering going through a review and maybe we'll send a letter at some point. How is that going to hit? It can't hit soon enough. And, and it just encourage you as a board to reflect seriously on the, the crisis we face is bigger than the system we have to fix it. So uh, with that, Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is our last card. Um, a lot to think about. Is there anything that you all want to share before I turn to my colleagues? It, it would help to get a little bit more sense of the timing. I, I know we were going to be sending out curtailment letters before and then it rained. Uh, what, what is the timing of actually starting to send them out and have you thought about the tranches issue how many you send at once, et cetera, that, that we didn't hear today. And, and it may be worth doing a, I'll, I'll let you come up with a proposal, uh, some sort of a call in Q&A or something so you don't have to talk to 100 water rights holders. I mean, generally, we assume that water rights lawyers know how this works and that people know their water rights. That was one of the issues we thought might be the reason people didn't show up. It's also possible they didn't show up because they don't actually believe it's happening. So there's, we need to think about that again, mindful of staff's burden. So what, what's your suggestion on the curtailment issues? So as far as curtailment uh, and timing, yes, we have held off um, to make sure that we accounted for the most recent rainstorms. And of course, today at one point was predicted to be rainy. And I see 70 degree weather predicted for the end of the week. Um, so we, it does take uh, several days once we push the start button to get uh, the process uh, to, the, to the point where we can actually mail. Mm -hmm. We believe that, certainly as we provided to you today on the San Joaquin, that no matter uh, which curve you use, um, that with the data we have now, uh, that there are uh, definitely curtailments that need to occur. Mm -hmm. 
And so we are ready to move forward with the first wave of those. Uh, and that would be likely by the end of this week or beginning of next week. Uh, because there are uh, distinctly junior water rights holders that, as you look at the supply curves, even with normal rainfall, will never come back into the system for supply. So we are prepared to start moving on those. All right. So we're looking um, at the post-1914s is the uh, group that we've been looking at. We've been looking at other systems as well. Um, but we will put up the graphs that you saw earlier um, with the most current information. I believe those were updated. They're updated to include the most recent data. They are. The, the precipitation data, of course, is easier to get than the uh, predictions of inflow and uh, full natural flow. And so we have uh, those uh, current as of um, today as best we can from the data that we have received from DWR. And we'll um, talk about an approach to be able to um, set up an opportunity or I'm not sure what it's going to be yet. We'll have to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, I'd like to you to think about options yeah, for a communication strategy. Exactly. I think that would be helpful. And, so, and I'm not going to ask you to go through everything that was raised today, either Mr. O'Laughlin's or other people's concerns about it being even more complex. I just uh, trust that you're going to take that in and then you'll report back to us on that. We, we will do that. And if at some point it would be helpful to you, we have pulled together a brief summary of the more common comments that were raised through the meeting yesterday. Oh, good. That would be helpful. That would be helpful. Okay. A lot to think about. Um, nice we don't have to make a decision today, actually, because there are many decisions. Even deciding what decisions to make is an entire challenge. So. Um, I'll turn to my colleagues if they're uh, there. One more comment, just yeah, sure. very quickly, Chairman Marcus. Um, you know, while well, there has been a lot of discussion of curtailments, there's also the question of what, if any, amendments should be made to the temporary urgency change petition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're trying to track this uh, water uh, balance closely because, you know, I do think that it's we have to seriously consider whether or not there needs to be any uh, requirements in a temporary urgency change petition uh, dealing with issues like carryover storage and contractor mm -hmm. deliveries. Uh, you know, the, the issue of uh, whether uh, the order in total is in the public interest, I think, is something that needs to be weighed carefully. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a number of moving parts and, and uh, controllable factors in the water balance, and we have addressed a couple of them, which then leave the others, uh, you know, for decisions by the operators, which is the way things historically have been done, but not necessarily the way that they need to be done if w the board is, or I, uh, or uh, acting in the place of the board, is supposed to be making decisions looking at the total public interest. Uh, so there is that, and I don't know if you have any commentary on uh, that question as well. Go ahead. I have a question based on what you said, Tom. It, the order that you issued, and I guess I maybe the question is directed to Mr. Laufer, um, is that subject to the usual period for filing a petition and a request to the board? What is the process going forward should there are parties who would like to ask for a certain aspect of that order to be con reconsidered? Yeah, I believe that we put out a notice of mm -hmm. that uh, order when it was adopted, uh, a 30-day notice, right. and I believe comments are due on March 4th, right. uh, and that those will, of course, be forwarded to the board as part of their deliberations as to whether or not they want to proceed with a hearing in the matter. Right. And we can also give Tom our feedback individually, okay. as individuals, now or however. Well, I, I would like to wait to see those in writing before providing staff my, uh, my feedback. Yeah. I suppose the one thing I would add is, uh, you know, as the temporary urgency change itself acknowledges and the temporary urgency change process acknowledges, 
uh, you know, it is not our typical process where there's a static decision made and then a right. period for reconsideration. I mean, this is a very right. dynamic right. situation. Right. That the executive director is constantly evaluating the new information coming in and, you know, very, very well may act prior to the, right. the March 4th objection period simply for purposes of, of reflecting reality. Right, and I think the purpose of this workshop was to allow people the chance to give a preliminary view of what they thought was in the public interest, and we have heard, let me just say, a widely, a dizzyingly diverse set of views on what our authorities are or what is in the public interest, and that's what you would expect in this complex world. We've actually had few specific requests about the order, but we've had uh, a lot of input uh, with very different views of what's in the public interest, and that is essentially an, an issue for us to decide. So. Along those same lines, and this is from Michael, uh, from a legal perspective, I, I've, what I heard largely today is are, are folks getting prepared for going to court over hmm. change but over the uh, curtailments. Uh, and so can you walk us through what some of the scenarios might be if if we are taken to court over uh, or if Tom is taken to court on our behalf uh, over uh, some of these decisions well, you know as we go forward each and I, I apologize I could only hear part of the question but as I understood it is as their various actions whether it's their curtailments temporary change orders whatever you know what will be the process and you know how will some of that play out in, in court I mean you know at this point in time the curtailment notices that will be would be issued for example um, are not in and of themselves self-enforcing and so the board might right. have to take supplemental actions you know that would go through the administrative processes um, and those in and of them those ultimate administrative actions could be reviewed in court uh, the temporary urgency change, as, as we've been through before, you know, those decisions, especially once they go through any kind of final process, are subject to review in court. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, we are an administrative body. It's good. It allows us to be a little bit more nimble than the judicial process at times. But at the same time, um, it means that ultimately there will be a reviewing body in the form of a court to look at the actions that the board takes. But, but will the the reductions in um, in flow occur if we ask for them uh, even you know while the court proceedings are are playing out so with respect to t the temporary urgency change and how that adjusts I mean unless a court stays the decision of the board the administrative decisions of the board will will be in effect the curtailment orders as I or the curtailment notices as I indicated are not self enforcing so it would be until the board takes some subsequent action enforcement action correct right and then it's an appeal of the enforcement action correct right. one quick correction the protest period for the temporary urgency change uh, is the date is March 3rd not March 4th oh thank you that's important for the record okay anything else well, thank you all for joining us. We'll have some follow-up and um, a lot. Oh, did you want to say anything? Oh, I thought that we were going to kind of go down the. That's what I was that's doing. No, go ahead. For it anyway? Okay. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, Sorry. thanks. I'll go ahead and uh, make it quick because I have a presentation to do. Um, I think that um, the comments that we had throughout the morning um, addressed m the notes that I took from yesterday, um, except for a couple. Uh, one is just... It seems that we probably need more clarification on public health and safety. And um, I'm particularly concerned about this issue of dust mitigation and um, uh, air quality impacts and valley fever. I think uh, if everything I've read from back in the uh, 77 drought, uh, there was a, a big increase in valley fever um, uh, as far north as Sacramento from, from what I've read. So something that um, I don't know if it fits nicely in that box or not, but would just um, like some further um, investigation on it. And then um, this kind of gets to uh, the comments that I made about curtailment and recognizing um, staff resources and uh, the need to get information out and work with folks. Um, uh, same thing on the, the, the real-time 
um, uh, uh, team that's working on things and uh, following up with a comment that Thad Bentner made that, you know, they're ready, willing, and really want to somehow um, interface. Um, uh, probably don't want to do something real formal that's going to take up a lot more staff resources, but some way to obtain um, information from those that uh, can be, you know, constructive part of the process. It sounded like he had, you know, an example of, you know, some ideas that might be win-win. Of course, we, we want to look for those as much as possible. Yeah, it's interesting, just to signpost, not to interrupt, but just to add on to that, is mm -hmm. the, you know, you, you can't, if you have a real-time operations management team, they can't be doing notice and comment and major meetings with a lot of different people. But as with our decision making, figuring out sort of a light touch way to get those good suggestions in and the mm -hmm. real world on the ground sense of it um, from people other than the projects themselves, I think there's some value there. So I just will encourage staff to come up to talk with the, uh, A, I think it's, thank you, it's, it's really good that we have this real-time operations management team and I, I gave them a lot of praise because those folks don't always get along or get together in my experience. So mm -hmm. foundationally, that's a really good thing that you have those folks working together, but figure at, figuring out a way to be able to get some of the expertise and experience uh, in the watersheds as well as other voices is important without bogging it down into being impossible since we're in a crisis, which I know is what you're saying, but I, I think that's a challenging tall order that we need to think about. Yeah, and again, we've already said this, but I really got a lot out of yesterday uh, and hearing from the different agencies and I don't know how often we should have folks come back, but I'd like to hear back from that, uh, the, the real-time team and uh, get an update all the way around. And to the extent uh, possible, um, in light of the fact that um, the workshop wasn't uh, real well attended, maybe folks are planning on coming next week. And if so, um, and, and maybe if staff could provide um, a brief summary of uh, what was talked about and um, uh, you know, information, a, a, a quick, not, not the detail on curtailment, but just sort of uh, the process going forward with when folks should expect to hear more and all that. Um, I, I think it'd be helpful for us to have that on, I think, Tuesday when we come back. So um, one other alternative would potentially be to, we could provide some sort of abbreviated summary or fact mm -hmm. sheet or overview of what occurred in this workshop. Since we are looking at a, a fair, fairly different set of issues on the 26th, um, it may be encouraging folks to, folks may feel that they need to show up to hear that update um, when they otherwise may not have because those are a different set of issues for them. Mm -hmm. um, so we could look at an alternative to that update as being one where we would put up some sort of summary of the comments, general comments that we heard. I would just hate to have folks feel that they need to show up in order to get the update. Um, that's all. And we could do both as well. Yeah, yeah it's so. just a question of we're going to have a really full day on the 26th as well. But I actually would like us, as I said earlier, to have an agenda item on this, it, these issues on every board meeting we're gonna have through the drought. So we're gonna need to have an update, I think, every time we meet real time, because that's it's the only place anybody's gonna get any transparency about the state of play and what's going on. And staff is gonna be so active, we're gonna wanna be able to talk about what they're doing and what the real-time operations team is doing, so. I, I want to, uh, Second, what uh, what Aditi just uh, suggested, in terms of making sure that sort of softly, deftly, I don't know what the uh, uh, what the adverb is, but uh, that we are in touch with locals who may have some out of the box thinking, not only about the short term where there's lots of of um, of need but also the medium and the longer term. I, I just think we're, we've got a lot of watersheds that we're, that we're dealing with, <clears throat> even in this, just these five. And um, I, I am personally willing to, you know, to set aside time to, to help uh, as long as I am uh, appropriately briefed as to, you know, what, what, um, you know, what, what can be, what's possible. 
And uh, I just, I, I think, I mean, I know in the Russian, there's going to be a lot of conversation among the, the wine grape growers, as we heard earlier today. I, certainly in the San Joaquin, they've been meeting a lot on what to do ab about uh, outflow and, and, uh, and fish. And the same is true in the SAC. And so it, there's a lot of work going on locally in those watersheds. And I just w want to make sure we take advantage of, of uh, that wisdom and find those if there are some win-win situations or if there's some less bad, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, which is probably more likely. Uh, or maybe some volunteers who just will step forward. That, now, I don't think anyone will go so far as to hurt it themselves as, once they get into court, because I think a lot of them will go to court. But, um, but in the short run, the more co cooperation we can get from folks, the better. And so I would urge that we really look at that. And I don't want to burden those folks, because I know they have a lot. But I think we all can, uh, can do more. Great. And Dee Dee, did you have other comments? Because I interrupted you when you were. I apologize, but I need to run because I haven't. OK, thanks. Thank you. Ms. Dodak. Hmm. You forget that Mr. Moore is the eloquent engineer on the board. <laughs> I wouldn't go so far as to say that. But I do have a question with respect to the February 26 workshop. Um, I think the, the, the format for yesterday was very helpful in terms of staff presenting the, the slate of, you know, of, of, of various actions and then followed by uh, DWR, which did an excellent job in presenting some of you know, their information as well. Are you planning a similar kind of scenario for the 26 with a different focus, obviously, in terms of here are all the things that, that we are working on on recycled water, on storm water, on you know all these various functions, and then perhaps um, some of some of the local entities who are doing tremendous innovative projects could present some of the ideas that they're working on. I guess essentially, I, I want to you know if there are any requests or ask uh, or expectations for the 26, maybe we can spend just a little bit of time getting it out there so that people one know what to expect, and two get an idea of what is it that we would like to see. Um, I, for one, would really like to you know, get some good ideas in terms of projects that perhaps we can get on the ground in the short, near term to address some of the, you know, the water issues that we have. I think a lot of you know, the things that we've been focusing on the past two days um, are very critical, very important, also very depressing. And the 26, I guess, I look forward to as more of an optimistic um, viewpoint in terms of, you know, here are the things that are going on at the local levels, here are some great ideas, how do we replicate them, especially if we can do so under the governor's drought declaration to get some near-term um, actions and results. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, anyone else have any thoughts to share on it? No, we have been talking about that. Okay. So why don't we let Karen talk a little bit about what we're thinking about. Cause well, it's an evolving that. agenda. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but the, the key theme for next Wednesday is, as you said, it's um, other actions that the water boards, that we, the family water boards, should be taking to address the current situation. So yesterday and today we talked about mostly our water rights authorities and concerns. Um, and so next Wednesday we expect to hear a lot about conservation, about water recycling, and other things that the water boards sh can and should be doing. So we've been um, working on contacting some speakers. The Division of Financial Assistance is taking the lead on that. Um, we are looking to bring in some of our sister agencies um, to hear with you some of the suggestions um, that other folks will be bringing forward. And we're hoping um, to work with various groups focused on our agricultural ag partners, um, the urban sector, mm -hmm. and especially as well our rural partners um, because they are being especially hard hit. And for them to bring to you what are the really cutting edge type of um, actions that they're taking, 
um, that could be better as promoted or move forward if we were to do something to help them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then what are other things that they may want us to do um, that would be helpful in moving both conservation, recycling, and the other activities forward. So we're looking, yes, at a similar format. I don't know that we're going to do as much speaking from the staff presentation standpoint. Right. Um, we will overview the areas that we're working in. But really, this is about addressing those other areas of the water action plan right. um, that are so important um, to addressing the current situation. And we will be getting an agenda out fairly shortly. It is in a bit of flux. I, I love that. And, and I think um, certainly tying this to the Water Action Plan, I think, is uh, the California Water Action Plan is a, is a very good idea, particularly the uh, uh, item one and two on the Water Action Plan, the making conservation a way of life. How do we help California make conservation a way of life? It's in it's it's a water rights issue it's a water quality issue it's a regional board issue uh, what should we be doing and and I hope that those who come to speak on conservation and those who come to speak on um, on working regionally I think that's another strong message that I've gotten every region has its own characteristics and so it's not you know what we do in one is not going to be necessarily what we do in another and so how what should we be doing to make these uh to make to help the regions become the best they could possibly be well with that semper fi <laughs> and we'll, we'll close thank you uh all very much for your attention and again for your good advice and work uh, off into the months to come. Thanks. that has repairing of